Okay, today, revisiting Mark Holder. Thanks very much for agreeing to talk to us again, Mark, in your beautiful garden here today. Um, when did we last talk? It was 2019, I think, early. So have you changed your approach since then? I wouldn't I wouldn't have changed it Si. I think um, you're always making small little adaptions as time goes on and I think probably the biggest change would be and it might not last is that I felt that the value in the betting was probably at the longer prices than the shorter prices so last season I felt I found I bet more horses at 10 to 1 plus than I'd done in previous years as a percentage of the total bets I had um, but whether that's just a temporary thing for last season. But, you know, I, I, generally the approach hasn't changed, but I'm always trying to go where the value is. And I felt last year it was probably at the slightly longer prices. OK, so since we last talked, one of the big things has been that you you made a big splash on social media, which we'll talk about later. But um, we did invite questions from people that followed you on Twitter and also you write in, in the Racing Post a few times. So we've got a load of questions from people on Twitter. I haven't got the names of the people that sent the questions in, but you're ready for me to go through these? Yeah. All right, first of all, um, why is it that you, well, anybody that's not seen your first interviews, which are still on the website, you specialize in hurdle racing. So why do you specialize in hurdles? And would the approach that you use to beat the bookmakers over hurdles work over fences? Um, the specialization I think came from uh, one of my mentors going back to the early 80s was a guy called Billy Bott that I did refer to in the early interviews that he tended to he told me that that was where he made most of his profits was over hurdles so from that point I was more inclined to bet over hurdles I did never really bet over fences but I did also obviously have on occasions done the flat but I never really felt that I was playing with the same edge on the flat so I concentrated over hurdles as far as cons as chases were concerned, yeah, it would definitely work over fences because, and I know that from Andrew Lowry, who worked with me probably back in the early 2000s, and I told him the approach that I was taking over hurdles. He adopted that approach over fences and has been really successful with it for the past 20 years, so no doubt it would work, yeah. Okay, so doesn't that limit, aren't you limiting yourself and your betting opportunities by doing that? Uh, I would think the reverse because when I bet, I want to bet with a, a, a noble edge, something that I know I've, I'm playing with a decent edge. And by knowing a lot about a few horses, I know that I'm, I have an edge. If I expanded it to do fed chases and flat races, perhaps I dealt with races up to a mile or say of a certain category or a handicap grade, then I would spend, spread, spread my time too thinly. So I think I'm much better off concentrating on a r relatively narrow band of, uh, of races. And even over hurdles, I tend to, I do bet in three mile races, but my best results come at two miles and two mile four. Okay, now you've, you've, so you're selective by nature. Is there a danger that when somebody chooses to be extremely selective in their betting, they can end up missing more winners than they do losers? Mm, I don't know. I don't think I, I wouldn't call myself selective. I really, I'm not that selective. I, you know, if I could find ten good opportunities a day where I felt that I was playing, sorry, pretty was pretty sure that I had the odds in my favour, I would be happy to have ten bets a day. So I'm only selective because I don't find those opportunities. Now, whether that's because I don't put in enough effort, that's a possibility, or the fact that the market generally has become more accurate uh, over the last twenty years, which I'm certain it has. So I have fewer bets now than I had 20 years ago, or even 10 years ago. But I think I like to think the quality of the bets I have certainly hasn't gone down. It's still as good as it was and perhaps uh, e even a touch better. My return on the stakes invested last, last season was the best it's ever been. Now, that could be two things. One is that by having fewer bets, uh, you know, I'm just finding I'm finding better bets. Or two, that the fact that I'm betting horses at longer prices um, because I think that's where the value has gone, has given me the opportunity that if, if, I'm, if I'm betting winners then, and they're at longer prices, I'm actually bound to make more money. There's obviously a bigger risk involved and the ups and downs of your betting graph are certainly more extreme when you're backing horses at longer prices, but it's probably, well at the moment, proven to be uh, more profitable. Now it's interesting that you say there that um, the, the, 
pricing has become more accurate from the bookmakers because I think most people agree that the, at the in business end, you know, the, the exchanges sort that out. Um, do you ever, ever sort of have to sit on your hands when you see a rick, what looks like a rick to you that's been put up the night before? Yeah, I always sit on my hands. Well, I don't really notice the ricks the night before because I don't ever look at the betting the night before. I mean, it's just no benefit. One, I'm not going to get on at those prices. Two, if I could get on, the amounts would be so small, it really wouldn't be worth it. And the other point is that if you look at something, say I make a horse six to one and it's 20 to one the night before, and yet at 10 o'clock in the morning of the race, when I can get on, it's 10 to one, that's still a reasonable price and I'm still playing with an edge. But there may be something in my subconscious that's making me angry or, or deflated because I've missed the 20 to one. So I'd rather not know what price it's being because it's of, of absolutely no relevance to me. It'd be like um, you telling me that, you know, I make something six to one, but there's a bloke in the lo your local pub who's, who, who's laying at a 50. I mean, it's a great story, but it doesn't have any benefit to me at all. Yeah, unfortunately he's not. <laughs> he's dead now. <laughs> <laughs> um, so let's go back to, this is uh, more questions from Twitter. How do you know that a horse that acts on good or good to soft will act on heavy? Well, you, you don't necessarily know, but if you, that so much can be gained from looking at the way a horse gallops. It, you know, it isn't, you, it isn't written in stone that if a horse gallops one way, then he'll certainly like uh, a certain going. And I've been caught out on that in the past. But if you watch the way a horse gallops, the more, when he raises his knee, then the higher he raises his knee, then the more likelihood is that he is going to be suited by a softer going. If they've got, as we call it, a daisy cutting action where the hoof barely leaves the ground as they gallop, then they're more likely to be suited by fast going. I think, you know, a lot of people don't look at the way a horse gallops. I certainly do. Um, it's something I talked about with you in 2019, that you can learn an awful lot. As I say, you can't guarantee that just because a horse raises hoof high that he's not going to act on decent going, <coughs> excuse me, or he's going to prefer soft going. But generally, you know, the way a horse moves will decide what uh, going that he can, he's at, like to act best on. Now, is, is that something that ever changes during a horse's career? Does his action um, ever change? I'm not sure that it's, I don't know. If, I don't know if it does. I think very good horses, very good horses, they they can appear to because they're because they win or say a horse really wants good ground it, just because he wants to good ground doesn't mean to say that he can't win on heavy ground because a horse doesn't go from 100 to zero as far as their ability is concerned because the ground changes their ability they won't hit the same level of ability on ground which is unsuitable but they can still win races. And you find that some punters, they'll sort of scroll down in the betting shop and look at the horse's results. Oh, he's won on heavy, he acts on heavy. He doesn't mean that he acts on heavy. The best way to judge what a horse is capable of doing is looking at the form that he's achieved on a particular going. So, you know, a way in, some people can find an edge in this, is that just because a horse has won on a certain type of ground, doesn't mean to say that he acts on it, it's, or, or he acts best on it. You're better off looking at the time of the race, the, 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 the opposition that he beat, and that can give you a better guide to, as, to whether, you know, as to whether he's going to be decent on that going. But I think there's a big edge to be gained by people saying he's won on heavy, he's running on heavy today, he acts on it. It, it really does not make sense that that is always the case because it isn't. Okay, now t betting. This is another Twitter question. Do you use a staking plan? Uh, no, I don't. Do you, have a, <laughs> do you have a stake? No, I don't use a staking plan. I, I tend to bet, I tend to, so if you think about the longer price horses, horses I'm betting at 50 to one to 100 to one, then you want to have as much on those you can, but, you, you, but realistically, you can't get a huge amount on those horses. So I don't have a, a particular staking plan on those horses. I'm just trying to get on as much as I can without the market uh, moving. But uh, you know, that sounds big. And it sounds clever to say you want as much on as you can, but reality is you cannot get that much on at those prices. I, I, I tend not to have huge amounts on at short prices. It doesn't mean to say I don't bet horses at short prices, but six to four, two to one, you know, I'll bet them at the prices, but I don't have the biggest bets on. My biggest bets will come when I've got two sides. So when I see good value in the win market and when I see good value in the place market. So 
that normally comes around in 60 minor handicaps where you're being paid a quarter of the odds of first four or 50 odds of first five. You have an automatic, in most cases, not all, but you have an automatic built-in edge on the place part of the bet. So, you know, if you can find value on the win part, you can guarantee that the, the place part of the bet is as good a value and usually considerably better. So, you know, those are the races that I'll try to have my biggest bets in. But I, I wouldn't say I have a staking plan. And I think you have to little, be a little bit more, um, you know, if you, if, you, if you put hard and fast rules into what you do, then I just think it's too restrictive. So I'd rather have a little bit more feel. You know, this it might be a 16 runner handicap with a five to two shot that I'm desperately keen to bet to, to oppose. So I might bet five, six, seven runners against it each way in that race, knowing that I've got fantastic terms on my side. So as a rule, that would be when I'd stake the most. Okay, so would you, um, for example, if you fancy the 66 to one shot, would you bet it? thinking that's excellent value for the place and if it wins that's a brucey bonus yeah absolutely yeah so yeah i mean because i you're know, very rarely going to think that there's a 66 to one shot uh, that's going to win and and if you know if you look at just last season because it's recent i think i had more big price winners last season than i ever had but the horses that won uh, 20 to one plus for me none of them if you'd rung me up in, in the morning of the race and thought what do i think of them i wouldn't be sat here thinking they'll win you know i thought I think the t term I used more often than not was I think they, they could scrape in the frame at a big price and not only they were scraping in the frame but enough of them were winning and that's really what made the difference.